I'm Vinny Politan. Great to have you with us tonight. Right off the start this hour, we got a big story. Big story we've been covering up in Massachusetts. It involves a police officer. Here, here he is. John O'Keefe is his name, and he was 46 years old when he died. 16-year veteran of the Boston PD. Um, was taking care of his niece and nephew after the sudden death of his sister and brother-in-law. Just an overall, every good guy. He was really a good guy and, and loved. Um, take a look at this house. This is a house where he was found dead. He wasn't found dead in the house, but outside the house on the lawn. And, and the weather was nothing like you're looking at here. It was a snowy, snowy night. Um, January 29th, 2022. This house, that house belongs to a fellow officer, Brian Albert. And he was out drinking uh, all night, John O'Keefe, and then was supposed to go to that house for an after party. And the allegations are that he never made it in the house by investigators because they say his girlfriend, Karen Reed, take a look at her. They say that she was dropping him off at that house. They were out drinking together, going, you know, bar hopping. And she was dropping him off at that after party. She didn't want to go in. And prosecutors allege that they got into a fight. They had been in a fight. And she purposely ran him over and then left him in the cold to die. Now, she's saying, no, that never happened. And police are covering this whole thing up. Like I mentioned, the house where he was supposed to go in is the house of a fellow officer. So you've got prosecutors saying it's her with her car, and you've got the defense saying, no, it looks like he was beaten up. And there's evidence in this case, obviously some physical evidence, like uh, uh, pictures of the victim, John O'Keefe. Take a look at, at this photo of his arm. And prosecutors are saying that's consistent with someone being, I guess, struck by a car. And the defense is saying, no, that's, that's from a dog. And there was a dog in that house where they say he was murdered. A lot going on. A lot of controversy surrounding this case as well. And there are a bunch of people uh, led by a, a, a local online a uh, personality named Turtle Boy, who takes a look at true crime cases. And, and there's a lot of people follow him and people in the neighborhood all of a sudden are saying, hey, wait a minute, she's being wrongfully accused and wrongfully prosecuted in this case. And they have shown up at the courthouse in pretty large numbers, making a lot of noise. Take a look. A lot of controversy, a lot of emotion attached to all this. Obviously, John O'Keefe is dead. Um, his family believes he's murdered. Some of the fellow officers obviously also believe he's been murdered. And then you've got the defendant saying no, the defense team saying no, and now this groundswell of support in the community for the accused murderer. Very unusual. Now, on top of it, it's not just happening at the courthouse, but it's also happening online. And this isn't happening in a vacuum. Like all of this um, is now bubbling over, and the DA who was prosecuting this case, furious at the way potential who he calls witnesses are being treated. And he posted a video online voicing his anger with what is going on and explaining a little bit about his case and the evidence. Let's take a look. This will be the first statement of its kind in my dozen years as Norfolk District Attorney. The harassment of witnesses and the murder prosecution of Karen Reed is absolutely baseless. It should be an outrage to any decent person, and it needs to stop. Innuendo is not evidence. False narratives are not evidence. However, what evidence does show is that John O'Keefe never entered the home at 34 Fairview Road in Canton the night he died. Location data from his phone, 
recovered from the lawn beneath his body when he was transported to the hospital, shows that this phone did not enter that home. Eleven people have given statements that they did not see John O'Keefe enter the home at 34 Fairview that night. Zero people have said that they saw him enter the home. Zero. No one. Some have, without any evidence, pointed to 18-year-old Colin Albert, a nephew of the homeowner, and accused him of attacking John O'Keefe as he entered the home. But phone evidence shows O'Keefe never entered the home at all. Colin Albert didn't commit murder. Jennifer McCabe, Matthew McCabe, and Brian Albert. These people were not part of a conspiracy and certainly did not commit murder or any crime that night. They have been forthcoming with authority, providing statements, and have not engaged in any cover-up. They are not suspects in any crime. They are merely witnesses in the case. To have them accused of murder is outrageous. To have them harassed and intimidated based on false narratives and accusations is wrong. The autopsy of John O'Keefe was conducted by a forensic pathologist from the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. The doctor found that the injuries that left John helpless in the cold were not a result of a fight. She further found that the line of abrasions on his arm was consistent with blunt trauma, not an animal attack. I'm asking the Canton community and everyone who feels invested in this case to hear all the actual evidence at trial before assigning guilt to people who have done nothing wrong. And certainly before taking it upon yourself to harass citizens who evidence shows have done nothing in this matter but come forward and bear witness. We try people in the court and not on the internet for a reason. The internet has no rules of evidence. The internet has no punishment for perjury. And the internet does not know all the facts. Conspiracy theories are not evidence. The idea that multiple police department, EMTs, fire personnel, the medical examiner, and prosecuting agencies are joined in or taken in by a vast conspiracy should be seen for what it is, completely contrary to the evidence and a desperate attempt to reassign guilt. What is happening to the witnesses, some with no actual involvement in the case, is wrong. It is contrary to the American values of fairness and the constitutional value of fair trial. It needs to stop now. I am releasing this quoted statement rather than holding a news conference because my remarks need to be so narrowly tailored to the issue at hand while the prosecution is pending in Superior Court. But the message is the same. What is happening to these innocent people, these witnesses, is wrong and it needs to stop. He's not happy. He is not happy at all. And this is going to happen throughout this case. There's going to be a back and forth. This is a very aggressive defense team, plus the folks who are showing up at the courthouse. And it's unusual. It's unusual in a case like this. So um, we'll, we'll focus on that part of the case on another night. But I want to focus on one thing that he said that I think may be the key to this entire trial and trying to figure out the truth, whether John O'Keefe the police officer never made it inside that house and was struck immediately by his girlfriend and left on the ground as the snow fell that night and died. His cell phone was found, we understand, beneath his body. So the cell phone data, crucial, and the DA spoke about it. Take one more listen to what he said about the cell phone data, because personally, I think it may be the most important piece of evidence in the case. Location data from his phone, recovered from the lawn beneath his body when he was transported to the hospital, shows that this phone did not enter that home. Okay, I get it. But I also spoke with the defense team about the same phone. Take a listen to what the defense says about the data they have related to the phone. Alan and I have been fighting uh, tooth and nail to get all of the cell phone data that we can, and, and guess who has fought us back to prevent us from what? getting that information? It's been, 
It's been the prosecution. The Apple uh, health data that Alan referenced uh, earlier shows that he did walk, I think, approximately 80 steps and uh, went up and down approximately three flights of stairs. Um, you don't do that by getting out of a vehicle and being struck by the vehicle. Uh, and I think Alan had, had said at one point, you know, what, what did he do? Did he, did he, you know, do laps around the car and start jumping up and down and then got hit? It's, it's just, it's fanciful, it's ridiculous. We, we know he went in that house um, and it, it's just the tip of the iceberg. If he goes in the house, she's not guilty. Period. Period. But you've got two sides saying completely opposite things. I need some help. Let's bring in an expert to help sort it all out. Joining us tonight from Arlington, Virginia, a true pioneer in the field of mobile forensics, director of digital forensics for Hive International, Sam Brothers is with us tonight. Sam, thank you so much. Great to have you. I need help here. I've got a prosecutor saying the location data of the cell phone says he never entered the home. And I've got the defense saying that the Apple Health information shows him taking 80 steps, going up and down some stairs. Okay, can, can they both be true? Yes, uh, actually they can, Vinny, and it's a really good question. So um, it's really interesting that none of that GPS data shows that he's been in the house, and I think that is really of critical importance here. The information that the defense is talking about, this 80 steps and the three flights of going up and down, that health data is actually written out to the data set every about 60 seconds. So that information could be up to 60 seconds old. So, and, and even that information could be affected by weather, which we both know was pretty bad at the time. So the 100% accuracy of that information I couldn't rely on 100% anyway, so maybe off slightly. And also, again, like I said before, that information could have been held for a little bit, so there could be some delay in, in that information getting written to the phone itself. Does that make sense? It does. So now I, we know what they were doing before, right? So the, the, the prosecution theory is they're in a car coming back from the bar, so that's going to take more than a minute. So they'd just be sitting in the Correct. car. Yeah. Yeah, and going over things like speed bumps and things like that could also trigger things like steps uh, and things like barometric pressure. Um, so even going up a hill may also affect um, or trigger the uh, iPhone to thinking that it's going uphill or even downhill. So that could also likely show that um, or make it think that he's going up or down steps as well. So that again, scientifically could lead one to believe that he might be going up or down steps and would be a logical explanation for what's going on here. And can driving in a car replicate taking steps? It absolutely could. This, this up and down jarring motion um, could certainly do that, replicate that kind of information in a device um, on occasion. Um, it, there are several factors that go into creating the data that goes into that health database. And, you know, it's, it, it is certainly plausible in this case. And since we know he was in a car traveling just before he got there, you know, it, it certainly sounds like that in, in this case. Does that make sense? Yes. And one final question. What, what sure. do you suppose the Apple Health would say if he is struck by a car? I would expect uh, that GPS data to stop uh, suddenly. And I also would expect that um, if he's wearing some kind of a watch monitor, I would expect that that, that heart monitor to stop as well. Um, and I would expect that uh, his GPS data would stop. I would expect all of that to, to be consistent. Sam Brothers, um, I'm sure we're going to be calling on you again and again and again. We appreciate your time tonight. I know how valuable it is. Thank you very much. appreciate your time, Ben. All right, let's bring in our think tank. Joining us tonight in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor Albert Wunsch III. Also joining us in Stanford, Connecticut, criminal defense attorney Darnell Crossland. And in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, family law attorney Jennifer Brandt. Great to see everyone tonight. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay, I'm trying to figure out, did he, if he, if he gets, if they can prove that he went in the house, the defense, I, I believe it's game over here. Um, what do you make of all this, Al? Our expert says, wait a minute, these two findings could be consistent. You know, maybe the car could replicate some of this Apple Hell stuff. What do you think, Al? I think the jury's got to have a headache with this one, trying to figure this out, because this is a very, very key, crucial issue. And if they can't tell me whether or not it was because he was going up and down on the street for 60 minutes, 60 seconds before he got hit by the vehicle or because he was actually in the house. I mean, that is crucial to this case. And it may bring that uh, reasonable doubt up for a jury as to whether or not this is exactly what the prosecution is saying happened. I also don't think it was a brilliant move for the prosecutor or the district attorney in this case to get up there and make that public service announcement. I thought that was ridiculous. Well, I mean, that's not let me tell you, things are getting intense. Doing. Things are getting super intense up there. I, I understand that, but the, you know what? He's supposed to be above that. And for him to get on there and give this thing and just like, I want it to stop now. Like, that's going to make it stop? It's going to make it worse. I mean, you know, well, I'm with substitute teachers. That's true. Every that's time, you know, a substitute teacher tells me this is going to stop now, it got worse in my class. And that's what's going to happen in this situation. Darnell, what do you think tonight? I wish I was there. But anyway, um, so I do know that this prosecutor was really upset. The reason why I know that is because his right eyebrow, this one, was always four inches higher than the left. And, um, as it relates to his press conference, he says we should not try a case in the media right before he gave all this evidence in the media. So I didn't understand that either. Um, and, but uh, this is what this is what I want everybody to realize. If um, uh, one could argue that going up steps was indicated by the Apple Apple device, the prosecution is going to have a hard time saying yes, that could be that, but it also could be a speed bump. Or it could be going up steps. It's almost like the Philip Morris arguing about what can cause cancer. It could be peanut butter. It could be all. Once you're arguing that in the negative, you're losing. So if that if they're coming out the gate already saying that it could be this, but also could be any of these other things, they're losing. So like you said, it's game over if he's in the house. But it sounds like it's going to be definitely a hung jury or not guilty if they're going to be arguing about speed bumps and hills. All right, Jennifer Brandt, uh, do you want to talk about? The phone evidence? Or you want to talk about the DA's uh, eyebrow? <laughs> I think I'd rather focus on the DA's eyebrow, Vinny, because it was definitely up. But I agree with Darnell. I mean, talking about this case and bringing up all this evidence is exactly what he's telling people not to do. And, you know, he's basically enticing people to come in and, and make a bigger issue of all of this. Um, and by the way, where does this guy, the turtle guy, I mean, and all of these people, where do they have the time to get involved in this case and be so passionate about it? That, to me, is really incredible that you have all these people in the community supporting the uh, defendant here. And, you know, why? They're, they really are following this, looking closely at it. Oh, well, I had Turtle Boy on the show, and he said because he believes that this is someone being wrongfully convicted. He's usually on the but side of police. Yeah, to get all these people together, I mean, this is going to be some some trial. Yeah. I mean, this is going to yeah. be something to watch, for By sure. By the way, Al, I'll give you a little piece of history on that courthouse. That's where Sacco and Vanzetti were wrongfully convicted up in Dedham. I know you knew that. I, I did know that, and I stayed in their cell, which is now a uh, high-priced uh, hotel <laughs> in, uh, in Boston. Of course he stayed there. Of course he did. <laughs> all right, folks, they're with us the whole hour. Up next.